Okay. Hey, everybody. This is the uh, data science learning community. We're covering the book, The Effect. And today we're going to uh, review uh, the first uh, three or four sections of chapter 14 uh, entitled Matching. And so let me share my screen. Hopefully you can see, does this look okay? Do you just see the, uh, the markdown, the book down document? Uh, no, I see both. I see all of your screen. So, ah, so you see like studio zoom and your, I don't yeah, see your part. zoom. No, I just saw your, our studio and to the left of that, the, our markdown. Okay. All right. Let's try this again. Yes. Now it's just the rendered our markdown. Perfect. Okay, uh, so I will fill in learning objectives later. Did not have time to to do that. Um, so real high uh, level overview of what's going on here. The uh, matching approach is really um, just an alternative to uh, regression, which we reviewed, um, you know, the last couple weeks here. Uh, both regression and uh, matching, uh, really the, the main point is to control for uh, variables that impact both the treatment uh, and the outcome. So in other words, we're trying to close back doors here. Um, I really like matching. I, I've used this in my day job uh, for benchmarking various populations ag against each other. Um, in my mind, it, it it feels similar to to um, comparing groups where there's a randomized trial. Um, it's it's not really quite the same, of course, because because you don't have this this uh, random assignment, but you are weighting um, either the treatment population or the control population or both, um, so that. Uh, there is covariate balance between the two populations, which is, you know, what you hope to, to see in a randomized trial. So it has this really nice intuitive um, appeal that maybe isn't quite there with a regression approach. Um, you know, and, and with, with regression, of course, you're making a sum, you're, you're minimizing the sum of squared errors and, um, you're, you're assuming this linearity assumption between covariates and um, uh, depending on which technique you're relying on for matching, you, you, you can potentially make fewer assumptions um, uh, in, in doing this. Um, however, there are a lot of artistic choices to make when you're doing matching. And um, I, I think, you know, various software packages have optimality criterion that can be used to, to help you with, with what, um choices to make but in reality i think there's a there's a lot of judgment calls here so there's there's definitely artistry um probably a lot of practice that you need to to really do matching well um yeah so so once again we're trying to um remove the impact of confounders uh by uh setting the treatment and control populations so that they're they're comparable on these matching variables. You're removing um, uh, variation um, because that variation should be similar across the populations. So hopefully that explained that okay. It was a little convoluted, but um, this will become clear as we go through some examples. Um, one of the uh, running examples in the chapter involves a job training program. And basically, the idea is you want to measure the impact of this job training program on unemployed folks on getting a a good job. And the problem is you have uh, the, the folks that were actually um, enrolled in this training program um, was very uh, uneven split. There was an uneven split between males and females, uh, according to the chapter of the program catered to, to males, right? Advertised to males. So there was an 80-20 split where, you know, 80% 80, 80 of the, the folks uh, in this program were males, 20% were females. But then if we look at the larger um, 
control population. Do you still see my screen? I still see your screen. I was just wondering because this is self-selection basically, right? So I'm wondering if even with matching, we do an okay job because it feels like those women would self-select into that that are, I don't know, most similar to men in some specification. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yep. we, yeah. I, that's, that's, that's a problem, right? You have some endogeneity problems. Uh, I think one of, one of the downsides to matching in general is you're assuming that you have the universe of variables that mm -hmm. ex, uh, uh, to, to um, close all those back doors, right? So you're, you're uh, controlling for all of those uh, confounders. Um, but to your point, yeah, there is some self-selection. I, I don't, and this is a very simple example and, and just controlling for males uh, for gender um, probably isn't enough to do a great job. But it's easy enough to follow it, along. It, so it is, good. it is easy, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, so, so in this case, you know, we have this simplified DAG just on a single line here, right? Where gender presumably could, could impact you know, the outcome of this program. Um, but it also impacts whether or not you're in the job training program. Uh, so that's by definition, you have this back door. It's a confounding variable. You want to control for it. Uh, I think we already talked through this. Matching doesn't rely on as many as assumptions, potentially as, as, as a formal regression approach. Um, the author didn't really go into detail about this, but it, gives you more flexibility to get at the treatment effect average that you're really interested in. I, I know a couple chapters ago, we, we talked about the different treatment effects. There's like the local average treatment effect. Um, there's a, there's a bu bunch of others. Um, this approach allows you to potentially narrow in on, on the, um, on the effect that you're, you really are interested about, interested in, excuse me. Um, and then another point, uh, captured in the footnotes of the chapter is, you know, different uh, fields within academia prefer different approaches. Economics, he calls out as almost always using regression, not using matching. Uh, he mentions uh, sociology as being one field that uses both approaches. And then without really calling out other fields, I, I'm sure within social sciences, uh, some some areas prefer matching. Um, and I actually took a causality course on Coursera a couple of years ago. And uh, that was, you know, uh, from a, a social science perspective, but not, not economics. And it was, it was all matching. Um, regression wasn't even mentioned. Um, Interesting. So. I feel like in econ, they use matching to pretend like treatment and control are the kind of sort of the same. So it's more of a storytelling thing. Or if you have a huge okay. control group and a very small treatment group, then to like select the controls that are the best well, controls for the treatment. But it's I, I haven't really seen it just as just as a method without anything else. Okay. Gotcha. Interestingly enough, the uh the, the course that I took, the the professor uh was doing a lot of you know uh kind of like drug trials that weren't randomized and using matching, um, you know, so, so maybe uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, the, the randomized trial was not uh, plausible. They only had observational data, but um, that, that seemed to be the core of like his examples. And, and he, he definitely relied on matching, like covariate matching and propensity score matching um, to do it to, uh, to, to determine the effect. It's interesting. Um, you talked about kind of where you're seeing where you have a huge uh, control group, if you will, and maybe a smaller treatment uh, population. And that's what I've seen in, in practical situations, um, like comparing, um, you know, utilization of, of medical services among different um, uh, practitioner groups, right? Physician groups. Um, I might have an, uh, like a control benchmark population that has 30, 30 million, you know, records or something like that. But the, the 
the practice that I'm interested in might only have like 10,000 records. So you, you do have a lot of opportunities from your control group to, to get good matches to that, to that treatment group, which is good. So you can get like multiple matches per, um, per individual, for instance, that you're looking at, uh, at an individual provider practice. All right. Um, so the next section is just about weighted averages. Um, basically, the, the point is you're either weighting the treatment population that, or those observations or the control uh, group um, so that, you know, the two populations look look similar. It's kind of um, and, and, and that weight actually might be a 1.0. So it's truly really not no weighting depending on which methodology you use here. Um, but again, the, the, the idea here is you're, you're kind of reweighting uh, uh, one or both populations so that they are comparable uh, in terms of matching variables, which are that what you believe are the uh, confounding uh, variables that you need to need to control for. And uh, yeah, just a refresher, you know, formula here. I think you probably know what a weight, weighted average is. Uh, you know, where um, typically you're going to assign more weight um, to, uh, for instance, a, a control population if it's similar to a observation in the in the treatment group, and if it's not as similar, you'd probably um, use a smaller weight. Um, and as I mentioned, you can apply weights to the, the treatment control population or both. In practice, I, I think it's more common to adjust the, the um, control group uh, as opposed to the, the, the treatment group, but it, it can go both ways. Um, then returning to our job training uh, example that we just talked about. So, you know, the idea here is we have 100 folks in the treatment group. Our control group has a thousand, and you know we talked about that eighty twenty split, male female in the treatment, and the fifty fifty split in the control group. Um, if we just compared uh, the the proportion of individuals that got a, a good job uh, in treatment and control, we, you know we see a seventy two percent rate in the treatment group, sixty two and a half in the control group. Um, so that would suggest that, you know, maybe the treatment effect is nine and a half percent. But as we know, uh, we believe gender is a, is a confounding variable. It's, it creates this back door. So that is not really a valid measurement of the treatment effect. So what we can do is come up with a weighting mechanism uh, so that the control population um, has a similar proportion of males and females at, as the uh, as the treatment population. So um, this is just kind of a simplified example. One way you could do this is just let's use a weight of 1.0 for all the treated individuals. In other words, we don't really touch the treatment population. But for men in the uh, control group, we're going to apply a weight of 80 over 500, which is, you know, the the ratio of um, males in the treatment to males in the um, control population. So it's a 0.16 weight to the untreated men. And, and then likewise for women, we'll apply a 0 0.04 weight, which is the ratio of women in the treatment group to the women in the control group. And when you apply these weights to the control population, um, and, and try to come up with a you know a, a ratio of the, the weighted ratio of males to total, uh, it ends up being eighty percent, right? Because because again, each male will count as 0.16, uh, each female counts as 0 0.04. So with with that reweighting mechanism, it's as if your control population had eighty percent males, and then. You know, we, we already talked about if you just compared the, the, the raw populations without adjusting the control population, that the treatment effect was nine and a half percent. But you can, with reweighting, uh, 
you you basically see that um the 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 excuse me the the proportion the reweighted proportion of folks that got a, a a good job is uh 67% um you know um and not the 62 and a half that we showed from the raw population so you know subtracting that um 72% from 67% shows a 5% treatment effect. So not quite as large as we showed uh, originally. I'm not as familiar with matching, but so how would you interpret this? Because this is mostly because the women got a job and the men were basically not affected if we look at these numbers, right? Yeah, I mean, we can see. Oh yeah, I mean a bit, yeah. If Actually, just, no, it's just the men that do better. Ah, no, both of them. Okay, sorry, never mind. This is a, I forgot to put women in here, but yeah, you could see men, men are better at getting jobs through this program. Um, so in the treatment group, just 75% just of the men got a job. It was 6%. This is women. Uh, again, I forgot the label there. Got a job. Control group, you know, different figures, but the same basic relationship applies. 70% of men got a job, 55% of women got a job so is there like a way i mean now these are like made up numbers i'm guessing because they're so nice yes. um yes. is there a way to see in matching how this differs or like for heterogeneity across the sample so in in this this approach we we weren't really doing like a one-to-one -one matching this is really just a re-weighting mechanism mm -hmm. right so it's as if our sample, our control group really had an 80-20. Mm -hmm. So we're just comparing one sample to the other and then say the difference is that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're kind of up weighting and down weighting individual observations to achieve that 80-20 ratio that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes but, sense. But, you know, we'll, we'll see later on, you know, like in a lot of matching exercises, you're actually throwing out um, data points. Uh, right, so you're only keeping that where there is a good match between treatment and control. But here we're we're keeping everything. We're just kind of doing an up weighting and down weighting for for our observations so that we achieve that covariate balance with with gender. Okay, and then this is the third section, and. Uh, Really, we're we're still constrained to just looking at a single variable, um, as opposed to you know uh, a bunch of variables, which would be most most common. You'd be, want to match on multiple dimensions, but um, the running example in this section uh, involves credit card debt, and, and basically the idea is you want to study the the effect of being late on an April payment for a credit card on on being late in September. Um, and in this simplified example, we assume the only back door is the size of your bill in, in April, right? So if you had a huge outstanding, uh, balance in April, um, obviously you would think that might have negative connotations in your ability to pay the bill in April, but also, you know, late, later down the road too, in September, there's probably a, a positive correlation there. And so again, this is over oversimplified, but that's what we're um, in, in this case, that's our only back door. So uh, there are two basic approaches uh, to doing matching. One is called distance matching. I, I've also seen the term just covariate matching. Um, and the idea there is observations are similar um, if they have similar values of these matching variables. And so you, you, want to take the distance between um, observations in the treatment group and observations in the control group. And, uh, you know, ideally you'd minimize that distance so that, you know, effectively your, your treatment and, and controls do look very similar on those, those matching variables. And this is just a, a, a DAG uh, from the book. Uh, you know, you have a, in this case, a few back doors, A, B, and C, that are influencing uh, treatment and outcome. 
the idea is that in aggregate, um, you would have similar values uh, of A, B, and C in both the treatment and, and outcome, uh, sorry, <laughs> in the treatment and control populations uh, so that, you know, um, effectively you're, you're closing the back doors. So you're removing, removing that, um, the impact of that, the variation of those variables, because they're, they're, the, they're similar across the two populations. Yeah. So you just close the back door by getting rid of the variation. That's right. That That's right. And this plot here, it's a little confusing. Um, but this again, refers to this credit card example and Again, the, the, the confounding variable that we're worried about is, is the bill in April. And so um, we have black um, uh, dots here, and we have kind of these white or translucent dots as well. The black um, would be the treatment uh, group, meaning they, they're, they're late in April. Um, the, the white or clear dots would indicate not late. In April, so that those that's the that's the control population, and this is kind of weird because in the book they reference observation numbers, so you can think of this as like a row in your data set, and so we have observation ten thousand three hundred five. It's it's a treated um, individual, meaning this person was late in April. We want to find a comparable control group uh, observation, the closest one, um, on on the build in April dimension, because that's the only variable we're interested in. So we got to find a white or clear dot that's closest to observation ten three hundred five here on on this x axis, and and the one that is closest here, you can see it is is twenty seven. 281. Again, this is just an, like an index. So that, that doesn't really have much uh, of an interpretation in terms of the value here. It's just, just the index in the, in the data set. Um, but, you know, if you were to select two matches, you'd throw in observation 27719 as well, because that's also pretty close to 10305 um, in terms of, you know, the outstanding balance here. You're still kind of in that range of, of 91,600 in total balance that, you know, they're, they're pretty close. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. So this is kind of, we're, we're trying to find for, for each treated observation, we're trying to find one or more similar control group examples. And here we've identified yeah. at least one, maybe, maybe two here that are similar enough. And then there's a the difference in whether you can reuse the controls, right? If that then changes how how you pick the closest neighbor. Yeah, yeah. So that's we'll get into that. That's the uh, the bias variance trade off. There's, there's mm -hmm. pros and cons to doing to doing both. Um, but that's part of the artistry in doing matching. Um, yeah. So we'll we'll go over some of the the pros and cons of mm -hmm. of doing each. Um, so so what so we just reviewed an example of of just covariate matching. The other thing we can do is what's called propensity score matching. And the idea here is that observations are similar if they are equally likely to be treated. So not whether or not they were actually treated, but whether you know they were they were based on these matching variables, whether or not they were likely to be treated. So the the classic approach here is that what you do is you run a logistic regression, although technically you could run any sort of machine learning model. Um, that would um, output, uh, you know, a probability essentially, you know, a, a score between zero and one. But logistic regression again is is the most common approach here. So here, your response variable is not like the effect size, or the, right? It's it's actually the treatment indicator, um, yes or no, right? So in, in the credit card example, it would be were you late in a April? Not were you late in September, and and then your explanatory variables would be all those matching variables that you'd be interested in. In, in this case, we only have one variable, so uh, your explanatory 
variable or independent variable would be uh, the size of your balance in April. And here's a DAG that tries to show you how the propensity score matching would work. Uh, it, it's very similar here, um, but here we're, we're closing the back door using um, the treatment propensity as opposed to treatment itself. So it's likelihood of treatment as opposed to uh, actual treatment. And I think we, we I already kind of ran through the mechanics here, but I'll just you know reiterate here. So if, if we're doing the credit card example, we'd run a logistic regression of being late in April on the balance in April. And those predicted probabilities that come out of the logistic regression are called the pro propensity scores. And you can do matching uh, um, once you get those those uh, those scores. So, for instance, we you know treatment no or observation number ten thousand three hundred five. Um, you know you get an output of you know eleven point six percent. So that our model thinks um, this individual would have an eleven point six. Uh, percent chance of being late in April. We know in reality this this person was late in April, right? So now we need to find the closest match, untreated match um, in the in the control group. Um, in that in this case, it's you know this this random observation number twenty seven thousand eight hundred twenty one. And this one also had a predicted treatment probability of eleven point six percent. So we're not matching on the, the covariates directly. It's the, the propensity for treatment based on our model. Um, and so that, that can be really helpful when you have a lot of different um, covariates that you're matching on, right? It, it kind of summarizes everything to one single number that you can match on. Um, you had the note there that including variables that don't close back doors can harm. I think just above the DAG. Yeah, that's a good question. So it was a footnote. <laughs> it, you know, I, there's so many footnotes in the text, and I just wanted to call that out. Um, I, you know, I guess the, the canonical example would be as if it's a collider, right? You're like opening up back doors. You don't want to just willy nilly, you know, just include any variable you can think of. You, you need to. This, I guess this, this gets to the point where like you should probably draw your DAG and make sure that this really is a, a backdoor variable. And there was a call out that, yeah, this including this additional variable might in, in, um, improve the predictive ability of your model, but it will still overall kind of harm what you're trying to do here, which is get, you know, covariate balance ultimately is what you're trying to, to shoot for um, in propensity score matching as, as well. Like, uh, at the end of the day, that's what you're hoping to have is similar treatment and control groups, right? After um, doing, you know, like one-to-one -one matching or just reweighting it in such a way that that your your two two uh, populations are similar in nature on those those matching variables. Um, and then we we have this this next section talking about, you know, do you do this? Are you selecting matches or are you just um, including all of your uh, observations across both populations, but just reweighting? There's kind of pros and cons to both. Um, you know, in, in my experience, I, I've done more of a one-to-one -one matching or sometimes multiple matches per treatment. Again, I tend to have situations where I have a huge control group, not so huge treatment group. Um, the, the benefit of selecting matches is that it's really intuitive, right? Like I have a thousand examples in my treatment group. So now I'm gonna select a thousand similar examples uh, out of the control population. It just kind of makes sense, you know? And it, there's, there's something uh, appealing about having like similar sample sizes between the two groups as well. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to implement as well. Uh, again, it's just a matter of finding one or more good matches uh, for each uh, example in your your treatment population. Um, and we'll talk about this shortly, but 
um, with propensity score matching or, or with reweighting in general, sometimes you, you can end up with really large weights for certain observations, which can be, um, that could be bad, right? You want to give too much weight to, to one, one single observation. Um, here, you, you just don't have that problem. Um, you know, in the case of one-to-one -one matching, everything has a, an equal weight. Okay, and so then the alternative to just selecting individual matches is, is you include everything, all control samples, um, with each of those getting a different weight, um, depending on how closely that control observation matches uh, a treatment control observation. That weight can actually be zero, so effectively you're, you're kind of throwing it out, but uh, I think just from an intuition standpoint, it helps to think, we're actually including all the data and just assigning a weight. Um, uh, so there are like kernel methods that we'll we'll talk about um, where if you know the, the match is beyond a certain distance, that weight effectively becomes zero. Um, so so that is kind of similar to selecting matches in that you're not really including uh, everything in your control group uh, in the comparison, right? It, it, it's essentially the equivalent of of, of having when you're assigning a weight of zero. Um, and then just a really high level intuitive way that you could assign weights to your population is just with this concept of distance. So for, you know, if you have just one example in your treatment group, uh, you're, you're trying to then look at uh, a random example in your control group. How much weight do you want to assign to that particular uh, control group example? Um, you know, you could take the inverse of the distance between the the, the treatment example and, and the and the control group example that you have there. So how would you implement that? Like, do you just have a lot more? Because the distance is always for the pair, right? So for every treated unit, you have the distance yeah. to the control thing. That, that's right. So do you just have a lot, a lot of the controls, like times the number of observations in the treatment group? Yeah, again, you know, it's 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 sometimes hard to think about all the inner workings. I because you use software to do this, right? You're not yeah. developing it from scratch. Uh, but the way I think of it is, um, essentially, yeah, for each treatment example, you are looking at every every control group example and kind of re reweighting it. Mm -hmm. right in a, in a way that's kind of proportional to the distance there so if you have something that doesn't represent your you know is, is very different than your one treatment example you're going to get very little weight almost nothing um but then for the ones that are examples in your control group that are very similar they would get a high weight uh, because the distance is 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 uh is lower but that that is i guess one way you could could do this again how software does this is maybe a little different but it, it's in my mind, it's kind of like using every every example in your control group against each uh, example in your your treatment group. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and by the way, uh, using uh, weights is the recommended approach when you're doing propensity score matching. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more on, on why that is. Although there's a, a lot of hand waving potentially in the <laughs> in the text about why you want to do that as opposed to just individually selecting matches based on propensity scores like we just kind of talked about with that credit card example. Um, but let's just take that at, at its at its base value for now. <laughs> you, you basically want to take a, a weighted approach for propensity score matching. Um, another issue with, you know, kind of like a one-to-one -one matching is um, you may get very different results uh depending on whether or not certain you know examples are in or out um whereas with weighting because you're including um really all or most of your control group examples you know there's there's just less noise overall so and, and we'll talk about the bias bias variance trade-off but really with a with a weighted approach you have more bias but less uh variance so there's um, so um, again, you're less susceptible to noise when you're doing like, particularly when you're doing a one-to-one -one match. 
Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways you can do matches, right? And we've already alluded to some of those. Uh, the one-to-one -one match, you can do a K-nearest neighbors approach where you're selecting the top, you know, two, three, five, nine, whatever uh, matches, um, you know, for each treatment uh, example that you have. And then there's something called radius matching, which is basically saying choose any uh, control observation as long as it fits within an acceptable threshold like a, a distance metric you know you kind of have this worst case and if it satisfies the worst case you throw it in as, as a match um, and as you alluded to earlier sarah there's the with or without replacement decision as well uh, the if you allow replacement you're going to get better individual matches um, you know, for, for each each treatment example, you'll, you're going to have a better, more likely to have better matches um, among your control group. Um, and if you're using uh, replacement, um, you know, there's there's kind of like this implicit weight that happens, which is equal to the number of times that control observation has matches. That's more of an FYI thing for your information. Uh, and then, you know, I, I've mentioned this multiple times, but you know, there's there's artistry in, in your matching approach, and it's all about the the bias variance trade-off. If you have fewer matches for each treatment observation, you're going to have lower bias overall, uh, right? Because you're going to have have a better fit um, for for each match, um, and then you kind of have that similar issue um, with replacement. Um, you're going to have better better matches for each treatment observation. Um, so lo lower bias overall, but higher variance. And then similarly, you could have this higher bias, lower variance situation, uh, which which happens when you have more matches for each treatment observation. Um, and you also have higher bias, but lower variance when there's uh, uh, when there's no replacement. Um, I had to think about that a little bit, the with and without replacement, um, why there's higher variance with replacement and lower variance without replacement. And the one way I was thinking about this is just, um, look, there's this formula in like basic statistics books, right? When you talk about like the standard error of an average, uh, and typically when you think about with replacement, your your standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. And when you're doing the standard error without replacement, which is something that I don't typically encounter often in the work I do, but it's that same formula, you know, sigma divided by the square root of the sample size uh, multiplied by this other term here, which is, uh, you know, the size of your overall population uh, minus n, which n in this case would be the the the, the I think the the size that you're using to match over the the total population size minus one. Um, so in, in other words, this formula shows that the standard error uh, without replacement is actually lower than the standard error with replacement. I think more graphical way to think about this is that, when you do it with replacement, then the nearest neighbor is always going to be very close to the dot, yes. right? But if yes. you do it without replacement, then you just take them away. So one point might be the nearest neighbor for two in the treatment group, but you take it away for one of them, and then you have to go a lot farther. And then that just increases variance because they can't be as close. Yes, that is that is correct. A uh, couple other points that were interesting uh, in this section. You don't really have to, if you have a huge data set, you really don't even have to think too hard about the bias variance trade-off. Um, you know, particularly if you have a really large control group, you can do lots of matches and you're not really going to affect bias much, much right? Because you have a lot of really good matches for each each treatment observation. So, you know, more data is, it tends to be better, right? I guess is the idea there. Um, with replacement uh, means that some, 
uh, control observations could have a disproportionate impact um, on the mean um, if there are multiple matches. So this really comes into play if you have a kind of a small sample size, um, which means your, your sampling variation is higher. Um, but again, we already saw that with replacement results um, in higher variants. Um, and then finally, um, sampling without replacement is order dependent uh, due to the greedy nature of, of, of the matching, right? So think about kind of randomly shuffling your treatment observations, right? And so you, maybe you just go from top to bottom after you've randomly shuffled and say, here's observation one, give me the, the best match, right? Uh, and so then you've you've taken out one example from your control population, but maybe that second observation, the best match would have been the observation that was already removed. So now you have a less optimal match. Um, so right, like a different shuffle of your treatment group would have assigned different different matches, right? So um, I, I guess that's what I mean by by greedy match here is like your you you are satisfying some sort of optim optimal optimality if i'm saying that right uh, some some uh an, an optimal optimization <laughs> constraint um uh but it's done in this greedy fashion where you might not actually be minimizing like a global distance metric you're you're doing one at a time and it's order dependent so so that leaves something to be desired there um and so uh at least with an R software, like you can actually uh, input arguments to say, "Hey, I want to. I want matches so that we're minimizing distance in a global fashion, not in this greedy fashion." Um, and, and and you know the 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 mechanism by by which this algorithm works is kind of beyond me. I just know it's like one of the options in the software. Um, but I will say that in practice, if you have a large data set. The, uh, the the greedy matching is probably what you want to do because um, it takes a very long time to um, kind of satisfy the, this uh, optimization on a, on a global level, like minimize the global distance, right? Uh, across all, all sam samples takes a very long time. Um, and it, it's quick to do greedy matching. Was that, that make any sense, <laughs> Sarah? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I was just okay. wondering, when you do have that super large control group and then you just take one of the closest matches like your results would differ a lot depending on which one of those you take right like um because one of them is going to have that outcome well i mean they're both in the control group but like i feel like that might make a difference right i mean if you have a smaller sample size you don't even have to worry about it because there's just one that you can take um yeah yeah. I, I, again, if you're taking taking one match, uh, you're likely to get a different result. Like, right? There's a yeah. there's a lot of again high high variance with that with that one to one matching. Yeah. Um, and the, the text really doesn't go into the greedy versus global optimization, but I, I think the idea there is, um, in a perfect world, you would be doing this global. Uh, you you'd want to minimize the distance globally as opposed to just doing things on a one by one basis. Um, but again, there's time constraints involved. So in practice, folks tend to just use kind of this greedy um, algorithm. Um, and of course, if you're sampling with replacement, you don't have that order dependence issue that we just talked about, um, right? Because that that match that you know was assigned to the first treatment observation is still kind of in your in your universe that you can match going forward if you're doing with replacement. So that's that's kind of a um, one of the pros for doing with replacement. All right, so this next section, and, and this will probably be the final one for today. Actually, do we have one more? I, there is one more. <laughs> we'll get through what we can in the next 10 minutes, but um, you know, this assumes you you're doing a weighted uh, approach, uh, matched weighted sample. How do you um, adjust your weights with distance? 
And so um, there's a couple different ways uh, out there, uh, different methods. The one is the, the kernel approach using a kernel function. And the second one is inverse probability weighting. And when you're using propensity scores, you're, you're going to use most likely inverse probability weighting. But um, you know, the book starts with the kernel matching approach. You know, if you've used any machine learning algorithms, you're probably familiar with kernel matching. It comes up all the time in statistics. Um, you know, I, I'd say the most common one that I tend to see out there is like a, a Gaussian kernel. Um, but I've also seen triangular and uniform kernels. Um, this book talks about a, a popular one. I, I think when it comes to matching, it's, and I'm going to butcher the name. Uh, it looks like a, 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 it's probably named after a Russian individual. Um, uh, Epinichnikov kernel. Uh, have you run into this one, Sarah? No, but from my Russian classes, I'd say it's probably Epinichnikov. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think you butchered it too much, but maybe I also Close did. enough. <laughs> Close enough. I'm, I'm not going to attempt it again. Um, uh, but, but this one, I, I guess, is easy to implement. Uh, you know, here's the formula for it, which is is why uh, folks use it. Um, it's bounded between negative one and one. So if you have uh, a distance that's beyond, you know, the negative one or the one, your weight is essentially going to be zero. And you maximize your weight uh, when the difference is in fact zero. Uh, and so, so just to highlight how these kernel functions work, what you input in is the distance, right? Between like treatment and control output is your weight. And the idea is there's, it's, it's, it's a smooth function. So you decline in a smooth fashion as the distance grows. And then it, in, ge in general with these, these kernel functions, they, they, there is kind of a cliff at which things drop off to zero. Um, one thing here that we need to do to, to make this work in practice is we need to standardize our inputs uh, before we feed it into the kernel function. So um, the example in the book is you, you divide by the standard deviation. Um, uh, you know, one other thing you could do is just kind of like a Z score kind of version where you actually subtract out the mean as well and then divide by the standard deviation. But the example in the book doesn't do that. It's just devised by the standard deviation there. But so that would lead to, if we have a super huge outlier, that would just not be matched, right? Because then yes. we get above or below get, the one, negative you, one. You would get a weight of zero. Yeah. So now we're talking about things in terms of standard deviation. So you're really only keeping things, I guess, kind of within that one standard deviation. Hopefully I'm thinking about that right. But but yeah, it, it, right. So um, again, we're rescaling to 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 take out the the scale, um, the impact of scale here. Um, otherwise, this this wouldn't really work, particularly with this um, kernel that we're talking about, because things really need to be on that negative one to one scale um, uh, for it to be um, included um, in the in the weighting. Okay, so. Inverse probability weighting. This is something that's used almost universally with propensity score matching. And, and the reason is, is this weight comes for free uh, once you do the logistic regression. Um, and so the weight kind of works as follows. If, if, you're a, if, if in reality you are a treatment observation, your weight is one minus P, P being the, the output from your logistic regression model, likelihood of treatment. And if you're a control observation, your weight is one divided by one minus P. So it's the inverse of the likelihood of treatment. Uh, and again, it, it kind of comes for free once you run the logistic regression, which is why it's it's recommended to use it. Um, so, so you don't really have to do any extra steps. The propensity score itself kind of gives you the weighting. Um, and I, I guess there's been some research to say this is the, per, the most precise way to measure the causal effect if you have a large enough sample uh, and you have a flexible enough method to, to accurately estimate the propensity score. Um, and then a problem with this approach is that if you have a propensity score close to zero or one, um, it can result in really large weights. 
Um, an example in the book is you get kind of get a weight of like, is it a thousand or 10,000 or something like that? Uh, because you know, you have, have this really large score of like 0.99 or like 0 0.001. That's, that's a problem. And, uh, I have a formatting issue here that I'll clean up, uh, <laughs> after this, uh, call, but, um, when you have large propensity scores, there are like ad hoc fixes that you can do where you trim the scores. So if, if you get like a 0.999, you might trim it so that it, you just make it like a 0.99. So you don't have, um, a really large weight. Um, that can be problematic though, cause it screws up the, sta the standard errors. Um, so another suggested thing that you can do is convert your propensity scores to an odd, odds ratio, right? So like P over one minus P, and then um, you rescale the weight so that they sum to one, uh, both for the treatment and control. All right, so we have just one a, of the two. Have have I? I mean, I think with propensity score matching, yes. I mean that, that you just use the, the the weights as kind of prescribed here. Um, I can't say that I've done this trimming approach that they talk about or um, this rescaling based on the odds ratio. That's not something that I've done in practice. At the end of the day, um, like if you're doing a randomized control study, you still want to check that you have covariate balance, right? Um, along multiple dimensions. Because um, that gives you credibility that what you're doing um, you're, you're actually measuring the true, uh, you know, the, the effect that you're after, um, and whether or not you're using this distance matching, which I, I call covariate matching or propensity score matching, you, you still want to check, you know, after I did this matching, looking at all these, you know, different matching variables separately, are, are we achieving balance within an acceptable threshold, right? Um, and that gives you some confidence that perhaps you are measuring the treatment effect that you're intending to, to measure here. And so um, there's this other concept of like, well, maybe I can set this threshold of, of what the worst acceptable match is. And, and so in, in causal inference parlance, you know, there's a, something that's called a caliper, um, which is, is basically how far off my match will be before I'm willing to throw it out. And so like, if you have a treatment example and you cannot find any observations within your control group that match within this caliper caliper threshold, then you drop the, the treatment. Um, uh, so that can be problematic, right? If you have a lot of those. Um, but again, the idea here is if you don't have a, have a good match uh, for a treatment example, then, you know, you, you really can't, use that for, for um, measuring the effect. Um, generally, the calipers are defined in terms of standard deviation um, or standard deviation of the propensity score. And then there's this, just a comment in the book that like the kernel methods naturally apply calipers, right? Because at some point, if, if you're far enough away, treatment and, and, and control group, you're getting a, a, a zero weight. Uh, we saw that with the uh, the uh, the kernel function here, where you know if, if the distance is too great, you, things are just getting thrown out. There's a weight of zero. Um, and then if you have a really large sample size to draw from, you can you can employ what's called exact matching, where you say like basically your your caliper threshold is infinitely small. To say, I, like, if you have a bunch of uh, categorical variables, you only want to find examples where you match exactly um, between control and treatment group. And the problem is when you have a continuous variable, it, it, it's hard to find exact matches. So um, what is more commonly done is what's called coarsened exact matching, uh, where you bin your uh, continuous variables, continuous matching variables. And um, one way to do this is just set up quantiles, right? Like you might have 10 different bins based on quantiles and then match on those, th those quantiles between treatment and control. And, you know, there's, there's this bias variance trade-off again with how you do the binning for um, uh, the, the continuous variables 
and also with the calipers, right? There's a there's the bias variance trade-off. If you have a small caliper, you're going to have lower variance, lower lower bias, excuse me, and higher variance. If you have a large caliper, you're going to introduce high, more bias, but you're going to have less noise overall, more precision, lower variance. So uh, again, there's just this artistry that goes into the the matching mechanism. Um, some of the software out there has some optimality type criterion that they're looking at uh, that may help you in making these decisions. But at the end of the day, um, you know, there is some subjective um, decisions that need to be made when you're doing the, uh, you know, ma making the decisions here on like calipers and one-to-one um, -one matching versus, you know, K nearest neighbors, um, et cetera. At the end of the day, what you need to make sure is, is that you have um, covariate balance between your treatment and control group. And uh, we're over uh, the 60 minute threshold at this point, Sarah. So uh, I guess I didn't, uh, I don't feel bad about uh, not having notes for the, <laughs> the fourth section. Perfect. I'm just going to hit the stop button. Yeah, please do.